Have you been looking for a way to stay focused on your goals and grow your MSP? Accountability groups from Rocket MSP can help. We offer weekly accountability sessions that meet online with a group of your peers. Your success begins with accountability. Go to www.rocketmsp.io to join your accountability group today. So I, I have a question for Zach, or at least a comment for Zach. Um, Zach, you, you mentioned the uh, cybersecurity that has 10 domains. Um, I, I found a, a map, and I don't know if it's the most recent one or not, but uh, if you look here, I mean, this is technically 10 domains, but that's a lot of stuff, man. How MSPs can't handle all this. Yeah, this is what I'm saying. Yeah, it's, like, uh, this is a great example of just, like, the sheer scope of cybersecurity, right? Like, the, these are all, like, subspecialties. Like, I can draw boundaries around the pieces and parts of this that I'm an expert in. And Brent can draw pe boundaries around the pieces and parts that he's an expert in. I mean, I see threat intelligence there, John. Like, like there's your domain right there. And the, to Just, have the full spectrum covered, like needs a team, not a person, not an SME, a team and of cer people. Certainly not a product. Well, yeah. here's, here's why I keep going back to the medical boards of a group association. You've got your radiologists, you have your rheumatologists, you have subspecialties. And I think that's where we need to get where we can put our peers into certain boxes and say, you do this. You do that, and then you build up your referral system to send that customer to someone who is knowledgeable for what they need. Right now, MSPs in general try to, they bite off more than they can chew, and that's enabled by the vendors as well, saying use our product. But I really want to get to this point where, hey, Shiva, your company belongs in this box. If you want to get out of there, go do your homework, put the time in, take the test, get the experience, and move up to here. And see, that's the problem. MSPs, let's just face it, the, the absolute bottom line is MSPs that we encounter, I'd say 80 to 85% are scared to death. And I say that respectfully. They're afraid that, you know, change in fear is fear of losing something, right? And so the fear is I'm going to lose, you know, whatever, influence under management or whatever. And that, that mentality in and of itself is a significant barrier and puts that MSP at liability because as that graph illustrates, there's no way, there's no way. And at the end of the day, we should be, I mean, insurance companies reinsure each other when their book gets, they get heavy on liability and risk. They, they go to their, their compadres across the country and reinsure themselves. We should be doing the same thing in it. Um, and so. That's exactly why we started Control All Protect, and that's the space that we live in. We're not an MSP. We don't want to be an MSP. Uh, you know, my our, my business partner, our chief technology officer, Hans Lemons, commonly tells MSP, "Stop. We're not your enemy." Um, so, if you partner with the right cyber consulting firm, um, you can identify the threat models. Cybersecurity, it is complex. We know that, but from an MSP perspective. It doesn't always have to be, and taking the uh, taking the approach of, hey, I'm I am the the one stop for my client, so whatever I say, they're going to listen to. Yes, that's true, but they're also um, going to turn to you when they're extorted, uh, and they were counting on you for that guidance, and you didn't give it. So, so I want to maybe uh, let's talk about insurance companies for a second. Uh, and I'll direct this question to Brent because I know he's been trying to get in a couple of times. So I just try to be fair to him and open it up to everybody else. You know, me and Shiva have talked to, uh, to nauseam for quite some time um, around insurance companies being the de facto policy regulator for um, for MSPs and for small businesses. To be to be honest. But when you keep seeing in the news feeds, like CNA gets popped and all these insurance companies are getting popped 
because they're not drinking their own Kool-Aid. They're not protecting their own house when they should be, you know, what they're requiring their customers. And let's just be honest, you know, I literally went through, you know, some of the insurance reg re regulations. It says, have you conducted a third party pen test assessment recently? And I called up my broker. What exactly are you looking for in this report? They had no answers, none, right? So, I mean, can I just literally create a DBA now because I am a cybersecurity firm that does pen testing and pump out an MAP result and say, yep, all my ports are closed. We're good. Well, I, I mean, you make a good point. And I think that there has been a significant amount of um, neglect from the, the providers. What I can, what I will say is that I think that there is a paradigm shift. Um, I have seen questionnaires for the last 10 years. Okay. Uh, back when I was in banking and, in, in the uh, top 10 bank, I mean, even back then the questionnaires were nowhere near uh, as granular as they are today. Um, you're seeing, we're seeing insurance companies, as you just mentioned, they won't pay the claims. If you're not, you don't have security awareness training programs. Um, if you can't prove that you were not negligent, they're not paying the claims. And we, and the, of course they govern this. So, uh, you have to be really careful how you answer those questionnaires because they're retaining that data to use against you, uh, in the, in the future. If you say that, yes, you have network, network segmentation for EPHI or PII, depending on your industry, if, then there's compromise business. About compromise and lo and behold, so the data, well, they're going to look back and cite that and say, no, you told us that was segmented and now two different servers got hit. We're not, we're not paying this full frame, but that's what we're seeing. So, hey, um, oh, sorry. and I can certainly, you know, send this out, but there, there's a lot of, of granular questions taking place now from just about all the major cyber providers. So you really can't run from it anymore. So, Brad, just to push back on that before Shiva jumps in, if you don't mind, please. So, you know, when you have, when you're a business and you're going to your broker and saying, I need cybersecurity insurance, when is it, do you think, because you're more, clearly you're more in this conversation than I am. So that's why I'm asking you, hey, this is the problems that I've been seeing, you know, your broker will be part of five, 10 different agencies. Um, and they will come back and say, okay, you can get coverage with these two companies, but you've got to fill out these 70 questions or this other company who said they'll cover you, they just need five questions answered. You know, when is that going to become a baseline, do you think? Well, I, I mean, I, I think fundamentally we have to step back and look at what those, the policy, we spent a lot of time studying SAP language. What is, what is the policy doing? What riders are necessary for your threat model? It goes back to what I was saying earlier. If you haven't started, you know, we, we have to have algebra before we treat, even go into trig, right? So what is the threat, true threat analysis for this XYZ corporation? Once we understand that properly or have a better grasp of it, then when we're interacting with that broker, we're telling the broker what we need. We're telling them what breaking clause we need. Uh, what loss of revenue clause we need if it's a hospital or a medical firm. So again, there, I always say, I don't let the, I never let the tail wag the dog. Um, if, if you're reliant, it's an MSP. If you're going to your broker and you're letting them tell you, they're just, I mean, it's like anything else. They're just shopping. You might as well be booking a cruise and, and, and going to a cruise director or a, a travel agent. Um, no, that's not the approach. Uh, it should be fundamentally defined what is the threat model for this client where do they sit and quite frankly that's the first thing we analyze with every client and it 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 forms and and i guess you'd say it streamlines the behavior because we start a cyber security program because of that conversation it immediately sets us into a cyber security program and that without a documented policy Without a documented approach and behavior within the organization, these cyber insurance companies, they know. I mean, they can tell. 
and you know, whether it's Corvus or Chubb or Travelers or Beasley, I don't care. Pick, take your pick. They're pulling their own threaded tail. I mean, they're pulling stuff from recorded future. They're pulling stuff from various sources. And a lot of times it's old scripted threat intelligence, but at the end of the day, that's being used to calculate the premiums and the risk underwriting risk for those clients. So what we find is that oftentimes they'll come out with, okay, this is a $15,000 annual policy and they cite, you know, this is what we'll cover. And then we go to bat for the client and somebody like control Alt protect defends why they need to offset that, that premium. And here are, here are the steps we've put in place and, you know, we, we fundamentally go through that process. So yeah, it, it's, it's, there's a lot to it. Um, but if we don't start out and understand the threat analysis before we start shopping for rates or shopping for policies, and they're all different. I mean, right. They all have their own little, their own little special ingredient, the toppings on each one, um, you do need a consultant. And more importantly, the questions need to be asked. Most policies don't enable you to choose your own cyber counsel. You're married to the cyber breach coach that's within that policy. That's that's a tragedy in and of itself. And furthermore, they choose the manual document review. If you have a business email compromise, they get to choose the manual document review. So if you do some analysis and you do your homework on that, as an MSP, your company has compromised. They go to the cyber insurance company and they control everything. Now that you're at the mercy of a breach coach, they hire somebody like Control Alt Protect to do forensic analysis. We give them a you know, PSC files and okay, here's the subject matter. It's five, it's five inboxes have been impacted or five profiles with an Office 365. And now they hire a company that's got college kids who are sifting through it, plugging PII accounts into a, a, a you know graphic interface, some portal. And, and spitting out, okay, well, it's a thousand or whatever. And depending on that threshold in the corporate respective state, I mean, your client's reputation's on the line for a massive corrupt process. It's this a mess. The whole oh, process is a mess. And we work with uh, one of the largest breach coach firms in the world is McDonald Hopkins out of Miami, Florida. I recently asked one of their breach coach attorneys, this is my question to her. I said, how many repeat offenders do you have? And she said, 80%. And we were talking about business email compromise. Why is that? Because the guys doing the manual document review, they're not trained in to threat, huh? They're not looking for, uh, you know, indications of compromise in other areas of, of the company. So there's, there's a big problem here, uh, with, and it all begins with that cyber policy and understanding that sample language. And making sure that there's some flexibility for your um your client brent i want to follow up one more follow up on that um so when you're a lot of times so i'll put my incident response hat on because that's about 80 percent of the business that i do um a lot of times when we get into an incident response case companies don't understand what is really covered and not covered by their policy you know just because you have an insurance policy doesn't mean you always have a panel sometimes you do sometimes you don't you know when are companies going to you know do like they do for disaster recovery or like an msp does for disaster recovery for their backups when are they going to say okay i'm going to pretend eric just walked in and stole 10 pieces of equipment from my manufacturing building or whatever it is um, Eric just hacked my freaking network and put ransomware all over the freaking thing. What does that look like? What is covered? You know, is, is the communication with the hackers covered? Is that consultation covered? Is payment covered? Are there broker fees for the payment covered? Is remediation covered? And if so, what parts are the rebuild covered? But we've, we've seen, you know, widespread of gamuts where, you know, of course, it really depends on the policy, like you're you're saying, Brent. But you know, some some policies will allow you to completely office space your entire freaking network and buy completely brand new crap. To some of us, like, no, you can only communicate with the hackers, and everything else is on you. Well, we'll pay for that communication part, but nothing else. It, it's a mixed bag. I mean, you're you're on air to ride. It is a mixed bag, and and I think. 
I mean, I think in general, let's just look at okay. our government and, and not being political, but at the end of the day, it doesn't matter about politics. Washington's telling us don't pay ransom, whereas in the IRS, don't pay ransom, and IRS is saying, well, if you do, you can deduct it. The same thing's true with uh, with these insurance providers. Uh, they're, it's a mixed bag. They all handle it a little differently. These seven that I talked about earlier, the forms uh, cyber attribute there, that's their purpose of that alliance. Um, their purpose is to change the industry and, and, and change it from a profitability perspective, right? Um, they're tired of paying a lot of these, uh, digital extortion cases, and they're going to put those requirements in place. As a matter of fact, even some of the states are granting immunity or protection from class action lawsuits. Connecticut just passed a law. That if you're you're compliant with certain, you know, I think I think they cited NIST framework if I'm wrong. When you guys correct me, but I think it's NIST. So, yeah, I mean, I don't have all the answers. I, I certainly see a lot of a lot of volatility just in how the policies are written and how they're enforced. And one of the things I'm they're citing um, digital terrorism clauses left and right to prevent paying anything. Or paying, I should say, um, there have been a few cases where they didn't pay anything. They usually pay something, but they certainly redact or reduce their total payout, citing those clauses. Which is frustrating for, you know, everyone on the other end of that. But I think it's also important for people to read the, the deck page on their insurance policies so that way they can have a better understanding. And if they don't understand it, they need to have somebody that does explain it to them. Absolutely. Absolutely. They need that. They need somebody to guide them through it because there are definitely potholes uh, on that, that path. John, it, it looks like you might have something to toss in here. I was, um, I, I was thinking about cyber insurance and I think that's a whole, I, I think to me, like there's, there's two things that are important to think about it, even though it has the word cyber in it, like almost everything else in this world. Um, I think it's important to make the distinction of when you're a business, insurance is on the business side of things. I think of when you're talking about security, there's a technical side of things and there's a business side of things. Insurance is always on the business side of things. It's a risk mitigation strategy, right? Um, when you're talking about like cybersecurity, it's really like, hey, what are the processing procedures we're putting in place? And then technology to assist to make sure that we're able to like develop a secure environment. To me, it was always a little weird when you have insurance being the forcing factor for a technical implementation type of thing there, you know, because now the, you know, yes, you want the business to be able to be aligned towards risk, but I, I don't know if really insurance is, is the right mode for that particular type of delivery. Now, that being said, I think it's incumbent on like, for example, Recorded Future gets into the third party risk business. So we do have like insurance companies that we provide. Uh, threat intelligence too. And you're like, well, what, what would you do to them? Are they trying to protect their own environment? What we actually do is things like we'll provide um, technical data to help them assist in, in evaluation. To me, I think this is an interesting approach because it's where like, I think insurance should be going when they're evaluating risk. It shouldn't just be based on questionnaires. We should be asking ourselves as well as other companies like, all right, you're a vendor of ours. Do you have properly configured security as we can see from the outside? Do you have, I mean, let's be honest, look at email systems, just a real easy, quick one. Do you have properly configured DMARC? Uh, do you have properly configured uh, SPF, right? Um, do you have like, what does your environment look like? How many leak credentials have you had from an external exposure uh, base in, in the last X period? Now, is that indicative of like, oh my God, people are reusing their pat, they're just their company email to sign up for accounts, or you really have a big leak credential problem in your environment? Well, now that's an informed question that I can then go and take to a company. It's a way better place to start than I, I've seen. I filled out questionnaires. I'm sure everybody here has. How many times you've run across a questionnaire question that you're like, I kind of feel like I'm on the stand in a law interview because this is not really, this is so technically in depth that it feels like it was written with words, but they're using words in a way that I don't think relate to reality. <laughs> you know? um, so I, I think like on one hand, there, there is a responsibility for us to be able to better educate and inform the, the business side of things. And that includes cybersecurity providers as to what are the realities in security? What makes a secure posture on the ground? I do think to Shiva's point, that's where 
an association could have, in my mind, the maximum value, not so much playing down to the end companies there, but playing up to saying, hey, this is what we collectively are seeing. And this is what you should be thinking about when you're designing insurance, when you're, and that goes for all these other programs that are out there as well. One thing I wanted to get into was the insurance policies. What we do for our clients is when we get the questionnaire, we give supporting documentation based on our answers. And I will tell you, every insurance company out there hates when we do that because now they're not rating us based on a self-attestation model of yes or no. They are forced to acknowledge the fact that we sent in documentation to justify our answer, which gives them a lot less wiggle room. So I would advise, not that I'm a professional in anything, that when you are doing these questionnaires for your clients, provide supporting documentation. They will, the insurance companies will bitch and complain, but at least you are covering your ass and that of your client. So God forbid there's a breach down the line. It's going to be really hard for them to wiggle out of any type of payment. They will because they have more money to spend on attorneys than you do, but it's going to make it harder. And that's exactly what a third party, third party auditor does. Um, they show up and it's just like, here's the questionnaire, answer these questions. Okay, you've answered the questions. Now provide evidence that you're actually doing it, please. Screenshots, written policies, signed off, documentation of sign off by leadership, management, and, you know, end users, whatever, whatever evidence you need to provide that says, yes, this is, this is a correct answer. And that's what you need to provide to the insurance company is like, I didn't, don't just answer the questions. You know, provide your supporting evidence, you, your documentation, just like you said, Shiva, that that takes away their wiggle room. That takes away um, their part, part of their ability to say, well, you said yes to this question, but our incident response firm that you're mandated to use that we brought in that totally doesn't have a conflict of interest uh, says that you didn't. Therefore, we're going to deny the claim. And that's a very, very important point. Uh, the downside is, is that makes, that makes doing those questionnaires a lot harder. So to push back and follow up on that, what leverage do you see you have? So, okay, we're going through a renewal. We submit a whole bunch of supporting documentation for their review, consideration, and approval. How do you enforce the insurance company to say, yes, we have reviewed and accepted your documentation as proof. When an incident happens, you can say, look, you've accepted it. What your firm is finding is the exact same information that was provided as additional documentation. And therefore, you must cover this policy or you must cover this incident. That's a bad faith argument against the insurance company where a breach happens. That's when you yeah. pay lawyers a lot of money for motion practice to say, hey, we gave you all this. Their mm -hmm. lawyers beat your lawyers into the ground and eventually something settles out of the dust. Yep. Spawn on. That's how it works. Spawn on. And, and I just want to throw out there that um, Monday last week, I had, uh, what's his name? Joe Cyber from Reddit. Uh, I had him on and we had a nice discussion about cyber insurance because that's, that's what he does. He sells insurance. So um, I would say for those of you that are interested in learning more about it, you should also check out that episode. I did put a link to it in the chat. Have you been looking for a way to stay focused on your goals and grow your MSP? Accountability groups from Rocket MSP can help. We offer weekly accountability sessions that meet online with a group of your peers. Your success begins with accountability. Go to www.rocketmsp.io to join your accountability group today.